I have a very important question for you. Are you ready for God's word? There you go, yes. Um, today, my, my most favorite message of the entire series, I get to preach it today, closing it out. So I pray that you're ready. We've been talking about speaking life. In fact, that's the title of our, our sermon series, Speak Life. Speak Life. We've said that there, are, there is tremendous power in our words. According to the book of Proverbs, there's, there's a power to create or tear down, to bring life, to bring death. We can do that over our relationships. We can do that over situations, circumstances, because words affect people. They even affect you. But today I want you to, to, to con commit, that's a good word, commit with me to doing probably the most special thing we can do in terms of speaking life, and that's evangelize. Now, I thought about, you know, calling this message evangelism, but that, that, that describes like a noun. I want, it, I want it to be a verb. Evangelize. That's what we're called to do. We're called to evangelize. What, is, what does it mean to evangelize? In very short, simple terms, it's to share your faith of Jesus Christ with those that need it. Share your faith. Let them know. Let them know what Christ has done for you. But it requires dedication. You know, Charles Spurgeon, I believe it's the one who said, evangelism or to evangelize is an irksome, dreadful task. I don't know if you use the word dreadful, but the word irksome, I said, what in the world is irksome? To irk. If you look that up, it means to feel pain, discomfort. It's difficult. How many of you know that the prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, called evangelism irkful because it irks your soul. But you know what I've learned? I've learned that it should be irkful to grieve the Holy Spirit too. And it just depends who you, deter who, who you want to disappoint less. If you want to... If you don't want to disappoint the world, then you won't evangelize. But if you don't want to disappoint the Holy Spirit, then you'll realize, you know what? Even if it's irksome to my, to my flesh, even if it's irksome to this world, even if it's difficult, it's more difficult to ignore the Holy Spirit. It's more difficult to ignore what God has called me to do. After all, Jesus Christ commanded us to evangelize. Read with me in the book of Matthew chapter 28. Verses 18 through 20. Now here, these are the words of our Lord, of our Savior. Jesus Christ says, all authority has been given to me. What does that mean? It means, listen, I'm in charge. I created everything. And everything will bow to me in time. You know, the Bible says that. That every knee will bow and every tongue confess. You know, there are no atheists on the other side of this world. What do I mean by that? It means that once you die, you will know there is a creator and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And, and this is the thing. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. Do you realize this is a call to be fishers of men? To be fishers of men. Do you remember when he called his first disciples? Some of his first disciples were Peter and James, John Andrew, the two bro brothers, James and John, the two brothers, Peter and Andrew. And so God, Jesus Christ, calls them off the lake, so to speak. Calls them right out of the fishing boat and says, you've been fishing for fish, but now I call you to be a fisher of men. Do you realize that is that call right here to you and I? Now notice what it is not. It is not... You with me? It is not the great suggestion. 
It's not a suggestion. Hey, if you get around to it, if you feel like it, if it's not too irksome, would you mind possibly, maybe on a good day, if everything lines up for you, if you're well fed and taken care of, maybe you can get around to sharing some good news with somebody. And if it bothers them, by all means, don't. No, it's a command. Go ye therefore. Make a difference. In fact, Jesus said this gospel needs to be preached in all the earth so that every man will have a chance. Just a couple of days ago, how many of you take, uh, do the Bible app and get the verse of the day? A couple of days ago, the Bible says God is not slow, slow in coming the way some have defined slowness. Instead, he's patient desiring that everyone would have full opportunity to accept him. You know, it's interesting because some people are so arrogant in God's face, and I'm like, I'm, you know, we should be glad, all of us, that God is patient. They're like, if God is real, have him do something. And I'm like, oh, he's patient. That's why, he, that's why we're all here, amen? We're all here. But the, but the, the thing is, we need to be obedient. First point. We're going to talk about three points. Obedience, urgency, and getting equipped. Obedience. At the end of the day, it's about obedience or disobedience. We're either going to obey to be fishers of men, to go in the authority that Christ has called us in, to make disciples, to share the gospel, to, to share the good news. Or we're not. You know, some people say, but pastor, I pray, I pray all the time. Do you know it takes more than just prayer? Read this quote with me from A.W. Tozer, the great, the great pastor. He said, have you noticed how much praying for revival has been going on of late? How little and how little revival has resulted? I believe the problem is that we have been trying to substitute praying for obeying. And it simply will not work to pray for revival while ignoring the plain concept, uh, excuse me, precept laid down in scripture is to waste a lot of words and get nothing for our trouble. Prayer will become, will become effective when we stop using it as a substitute for obedience. Uh-oh. Can I get an amen? Good preaching, pastor. Wow. That's exactly what we need to understand. But the truth is it that, that it's easier oftentimes to talk to God about those who need him than to talk to those who need him about God. Hey, I'm right there with you. But over the past year, every year I... I I choose a word that I want to dedicate my year uh, to kind of center around. And, and I, I let this word be a focusing uh, aspect for my year. And one year it was dis, uh, discipline. And so the whole year was about discipline. How many of you know God had me uh, do that for two years in a row? Because the first year I didn't quite get it. And God said, you need another year of discipline. But this year was about increase. Come on, anyone want increase in your life? Anyone feel like, I just need an increase of joy, of zest, of zeal, of purpose, a, 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 an increase of focus? You know, I just need something more. Anyone here today can honestly say, I just feel like there's, there's more. There's more, and I'm not quite getting it. And I've been praying for that increase in my life, in my family, and for this church, and God has begun to to help me realize it's about the Great Commission. If you want more, what you're missing, that something you're missing that you have a hard time putting your finger on it is my spirit. And my spirit moves when there's a commitment to the Great Commission. You want the church to increase. Teach them to witness. Call them to witness. Come on, am I... Am I Am I stirring something up in someone today that can say, you know what, I want to see God move in and through me, and I cannot wait. See, the truth is, 
We have, a real, tr we have real trouble with obedience in this area. 95% of all Christians have never won a soul to Christ. 95%. You might be here saying, is that me? If you have to ask, yeah, it's you. If you're like, did I win somebody? I'm not sure if I did. It's you. But the good news is, God doesn't want that. And he's ready to help change it. If you're ready. If you're ready to feel the awesome wonder of sharing the gospel with somebody, then come on. Come on, be a fisher of men. I'm following after Christ. Come with me. Amen? You say, Pastor, but it's irksome. It's, it's, it's nerve-wracking. I'm about to share with you one of those times where the Lord kind of made it really, really uh, challenging for me. But 80% of all Christians do not consistently witness for Christ. Less than what? 2% actually share their faith. See, the truth is that with all our education, our fine buildings, our image of church, we are doing less to win people to Christ than our unschooled forefathers did. We're no longer fishers of men, but keepers of the aquarium. And we spend most of our time swiping fish from each other's bowls. I'm, I'm just going to move on. Is that true? Yeah. It is true. We're called to win the world. We're called to win the world because they need a Savior. See, the Bible says, if you love me, these are the words of Jesus, you will obey my commands. And he is commanded, go into the world. Make disciples. Share your faith. Let them know there's a better way. Right? Right? And if you love me and obey my commandments, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will be with you forever. That helper is the spirit of truth. Come on, the reason we feel emptiness and don't have more of a zest and a fire and just feel tremendous purpose is because the spirit is waiting for you to engage him and to say, come on, Holy Spirit, use me to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to somebody, to a lost and dying neighbor, right? See, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Mm. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Each one will receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You say, oh, pastor, I don't know if I like this. I don't know. You're making me feel uncomfortable. Can I tell you, many of us won't move unless we're uncomfortable. We got to get uncomfortable with the status quo. Isn't that true? Think about it. Everybody's talking about America needs to change. America needs to change. It's not going to happen at the White House. It's going to happen in the church house. In the church house, when people get serious about the gospel message of Christ. You're not going to change a man by trying to convince him to vote differently. You're going to change his heart. You'll change his whole family. The whole family. I can remember when Pat first walked into the church. He was harder and meaner than he is today. Man, he was gripping onto that chair when that invitation went forward. But he changed, and now the whole family has changed. The whole family's changed. That's how you change America. Amen? So, there must be obedience, but there has to be urgency. Urgency. Can I tell you? Some of us have no urgency, and we just keep Keeping on thinking, well, maybe someday I'll get around to it. Can you imagine a lifeguard? I used to lifeguard. And do you realize that most drownings in a pool take place right under the lifeguard's nose? At least that's what it was with me. I'm sitting there looking out. Is there anyone that needs my help? Missing the little boy that couldn't touch the wall right underneath my feet. Can I tell you where I'm looking out? Oh, I wonder... 
who I can pray for over in this far country and this missionary we can support. And that's perfectly good. But what about your neighbor? What about your nephew? Mm. What about your niece? Your aunt, your uncle? And so they yelled at me. They said, lifeguard, the little boy's drowning. I go, where, where? He's right under your feet. I looked down, and he had let go of the side, and he couldn't touch, and he was going down. Scooped him up. Can you imagine a lifeguard that would stare at that child or that individual and say, no, I just, I, I just, it's not convenient. What would people say if I helped them? Or they may feel like I'm butting into their life or can you imagine a doctor that had a cure but refused to administer it? In first service, they said yes. I said, well, <laughs> yeah, to now, nowadays, yeah, I can see that, but, but let's move on. Can you imagine a firefighter seeing a family being engulfed but refused to do anything about it? Now imagine this. You're driving by and there's a man who you've seen before in town, maybe a lady you've seen before in town, and they're out on their second balcony floor, you know, they've got a little, little area, they come out and they're sipping their coffee and they've got their, their morning attire, this linen type suit gown, and they're just having a good time, but behind them, their house is in flames. And you see people walking around inside and, and there's smoke beginning to bellow and, and there's flames and no one seems to have any urgency. What would your heart be? Would it be one of urgency? Would you just walk by, drive by and say, man, I hope they get that under control. I hope someone helps them. I, yeah, I, I, I wonder if he knows his house is on fire. Or would you throw it in park? Would you jump out with some urgency yell at the top of your lungs? There's a fire. Let me help you. Come on, let's get out. Or would you be worried about, well, I can't step on his lawn. He really cares for the lawn. And, you know, I got to. Or would you be worried about him saying, hey, buddy, get off my property. It's none of your business. Think about it. No, no, none of that would be your react. Would be on your, on your list of preoccupations, or, or, or worries or stresses. No, you'd be worried about can I get them out in time? Can I? What if they said, "Be quiet! I'm enjoying myself. This isn't the time for alarms about fire, buddy. Get off my property." Would you say? Who cares about your morning coffee? Who cares about your peace and quiet this morning? Let me help you get your family out. Let me help you. Come on, you hear what I'm saying to you. You say, oh, it's not that serious. Can I tell you? That physical fire won't even compare. Won't even compare to an eternity in hell. I say, oh, pastor, I don't, I don't like to talk about hell. Hmm, that's the problem with the church. There needs to be an urgency. John put it this way. He says, we must work the work of him who sent me. Jesus is talking here. While it is day, night is coming when no one can work. There is a time coming where it's too late. We must do the work now. Do not be slothful, Paul says, in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Engage the Great Commission. Wake yourself up. Curge yourself up. Get yourself stirred up. I realize it's difficult. So I started asking the Lord, Lord, how do I stir myself up? I want to witness. I can hear you calling me to increase. I'm praying for increase, and God is saying the increase is there. Go get it. Look up. The fields are white. They're white, ready for harvest. Jesus cried because there was so much need. And so I said, okay, I'm going for it, Lord. But I don't know any non-Christians. 
anyone hanging out too much with Christians? So I, I, I'm like, he goes, oh no, most of the people that need to be saved are right in front of you. I'm just kidding. I'm just telling you, oh me? No, no, they're right there playing basketball. We built this beautiful basketball uh, courtyard. And so people were out there and they're playing. I go out there and you know, can I tell you, it's uncomfortable. I know it's uncomfortable because they're not there for, hey, do you know you're going to hell? <laughs> man, I'm just shooting some ball, man. Come on, dude. So I go out and I go, hey, how y'all doing? Who's the old guy? Oh, no, y'all can play as long as you want. Can I pray for you about anything? One guy told me, man, what's your deal? I don't believe in God. That's this, that's that. You know, get on with it, man. Hurry up. I get all that. I get it. I get it. I get it. I'm right there with you. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean the world's going to treat me any nicer. Oh, he's a pastor. By all means, listen to everything he has to say. No. I go out there and I start to bring up the subject. And sometimes it goes somewhere. Sometimes it doesn't. But I've got to deal with that irksome feeling that, that the enemy wants me to succumb to, but instead I have higher calling and it's called the Holy Spirit calling me forward saying, go and share before it's too late, before it's too late. I'll talk to you more about those times in just a minute, but, but there needs to be urgency. I'm going to drop down to Jude, Jude chapter, or, or verses 22 and 23, and on some um, and on some have compassion, making a distinction. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Pulling them out of the fire. Think about this. You say, so, so what is it that you want from us, Pastor? First and foremost, I want you to decide I want to be obedient. Number one, I want to be obedient. Number two, there is a sense of urgency. We never know when someone's going to die. Can I tell you, I was doing a funeral a couple years back, and I'm preaching the funeral, and I've decided if you want me to do your funeral, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm preaching the gospel. I, I just, I hate funerals. You go up there, and you talk about how good the person is. No one's good. Only Jesus is good, okay? No one is good. So if you want me to do your funeral, it might be something like this. They were a rotten sinner till Jesus changed their life. Give your life to Jesus. He can do it for you too. That, that, that's basically, you know, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> but I preach the gospel. I preach the goodness of Jesus Christ and how he's the difference maker. He's the difference maker. And sometimes people get all kind of like, mm, I thought you were going to talk about all this good stuff and just the easy stuff. No, I'm going to preach the gospel. So I was preaching the gospel and Pastor Larry Goodwill, Goodwill, he says to his wife, I like the way this young man preaches the gospel at a funeral. Would you have him do my funeral someday when I die? The next day, his wife was calling me. The next day. Can I tell you, you might be here today thinking, oh, someday, it might be today. You never know. More importantly, that person that God has put on your heart to share the gospel with, you don't know. You don't know it might be their day. And that's why the Holy Spirit is. And you need to what? You need to do it biblically. So number three, equipped. We need to be equipped to share the gospel. Now I want you to look at what Jude said. I'm going to ask you to put Jude back up there. And when you read the passage out of Jude, it says, with some have compassion, but you have to make a distinction. With others, you have to what? Pull them out of the fire. And sometimes to pull them out of the fire, you have to help them see they're a sinner and they're in big trouble. See, when someone is broken and humble, I mean broken and humble, you share grace. When someone doesn't know that they need a savior, you give them the law and judgment. You go, what? We've got it all wrong. To the proud, we give them grace. And we talk about grace and love and love and love. To them, Jesus is nothing but a genie. 
God is nothing but a genie. Watch, I'm going to show you a biblical way of evangelism because what happens is we're not equipped. But this fall, this church is going to be all about in their discipleship ministry on Tuesday and Wednesday nights about sharing your faith and preparing ourselves and equipping ourselves to be soul winners. To be soul winners. Listen to me, to be soul winners. It's true. See, we need to be equipped. It means to supply with the necessary items for a particular purpose. To prepare someone mentally for a particular situation or a task. To overcome these fears by being ready. Ready with our technique. You say, is it all about technique? No, it's not all about technique. I'll tell you the the, the main key at the very end. But it does take some technique, doesn't it? Because at the end of the day, you're dealing with people. And there is a psychology to people. There is a way that people think and function. And Paul says, I have studied and tried to become the very best I can so that, what? I try to be all things to all men that by all possible means I might be able to save some. Some. See, we're going to have to overcome this fear of embarrassment, this fear of rejection, of not knowing what to say, the fear of saying the wrong thing, and countless others. But we need to understand one of the main things we can do is just stay biblical. There is power in this word. Now, I'm not talking about arguing the inerrancy of Scripture and getting off theological with somebody. You know what I've learned? When I go and witness to somebody, if I try to convince them that this is, this is true, I've got an uphill battle. You know why? Because to the non-Christian that hasn't been changed in here and in here, this is foolishness. You've got a fish swallowing a man. You've got a guy splitting a Red Sea. You've got this. You've got all kinds of different. I mean, they almost sound like Jack and the Beanstalk, those stories. Only reason they've come alive to us is because the miracle of the Holy Spirit has opened our eyes. Paul says, without the Holy Spirit, this is foolishness. So I don't talk about this. The number one thing I can do just to, just to wet your beak today is to show you how to witness biblically. And we'll go through it over an entire semester to get equipped. But how to witness biblically is you've got to show someone they're a sinner the way Jesus did. The way Jesus did. And we can't be afraid of that. It feels uncomfortable. I get it. But we can't be afraid of that. Listen to what Martin Luther said. But Satan, the God of all dissension, stirred up, stirreth up daily sex. The, and the last of all, which of all other I should have foreseen or once suspected, he hath raised up a sect of such as teach that the Ten Commandments ought to be taken out of the church and that men should not be terrified with the law but gently exerted by the preaching of the grace of Christ. That's called cheap grace. You're not ready for grace until you understand how precious it is to save a wretch like me. A wretch like me. You go, oh, pastor, are you sure? How about one of the greatest soul winners this world has ever known in John Wesley? Not preaching the law proceeds from the deepest ignorance of the nature, properties, and the use of the law and proves that those who act thus either know not Christ or utter strangers to the living faith or at least that they are not but babes in Christ. Isn't that true? We have to understand that the law is what is necessary. You say, Pastor, are you sure? I'm going to ask you to go all the way down uh, who's back there? Katrina. Go down to John 14, 15. Watch this. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Who is that helper? The helper is the spirit of truth. What is the purpose of the spirit of truth? Go to the very next verse. And he will convict 
What? The world. Who's the world? Those that are not saved. He will convict them of what? He will convict them of what? He will convict them of what? Oh, but we don't want to touch sin with a 10-foot pole. It's, that's the reason there's no power. Because we're trying to skip over the centrality of death. Jesus said, unless a man die, he cannot live. I got to come to the point where I go, woe is me. I need a savior. You go, I've never went to that point. You're not saved. You think God just topped you off a little bit. I was mainly good. God just kind of. God did it all. That's why there's verses in the Bible that says salvation is holy of God, completely of God. I was dead, 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 and God saved, saved, saved me. Amen. Watch. Convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But let's keep going. We need to be equipped. We need to be equipped so that we can be good at sowing seed. There's a parable in the, in the parable of the sower of people sowing seed. I'm going to ask my anglers to come up here. As they come up, I'm going to illustrate this point the right way. <laughs> Jason saw me. He goes, you don't fish in that. I said, I don't fish. He goes, no, I would never wear that shirt. I go, oh, I bought the wrong shirt. I bought the wrong shirt. But come on up here, Chuck, Jason. This is what you fish with, he says. Okay. So Jason is uh, starting a new business. He's actually a guide now, a fishing guide. And Chuck was an angler. Now, I want to ask you this. Is, is becoming a fisherman easy? In other words, I've never fished before. Can I just go out there, grab your stuff, and just get it in one day? No, no. Say it loud. No, I got it on. He's, the, he's our sound guy. They'll, they'll, okay. Check. Okay. There we go. No, you cannot. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. I can tell you from firsthand experience, over 17 years fishing, it is hard. I got skunk last week. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. Chuck, um, are you any good at it? I like to think I am. But. Okay. Get, get, have you won any tournaments? <laughs> yeah, I won a few tournaments. Okay, tell us what in, you told in, the first service. In 1998, I was Angler of the Year for Honey Hole. Wow. Nice. Jason, have you won a few tournaments? Have you experienced success? Yes. And if so, did it happen overnight? No, not at all. It's, it's 15, 17 years in the making. How much equipping did it take? 15, 17 years, but in terms of hours per week. That's a hard question to ask, but it's a lot of equipment and a lot of hours. Okay. Four to eight hour trips. Four to eight hours trips is practice. Four to eight hour trips. In, in 98, when I won, I was on the water every weekend of the year except Christmas weekend. So. <laughs> Do you think that being a fisher of men would require at least that kind of commitment? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. How many people actually commit that kind of time to fishing? Not very many. <laughs> Not very many. Can I tell you even less committed to Jesus? But why is it so important to be good at your technique? You're not going to catch if you ain't. You're not going to catch if you ain't. You're not going to catch if you ain't. It's all I like technique. that. You're not going to catch if you ain't. No. <laughs> Double entendres. No, and, and why? Tell me about your equipment. Is there a difference? So, so the days of just putting a, a worm on a hook. Different. So you, it ain't, it's not worming like you think. You have to have the right tools, the right technique, presentation. You have to understand elements, weather, presentation. the animal. This man has got a jig, I've got a crankbait. They have nothing to do with each other at all. Not the rod, not the line, not the equipment, not the presentation. How many rods do you have? Oh, I think like 20 plus. <laughs> How many rods do you have? Same. How many know. lures do you have? Mm, 
Money wise, about five grand, maybe. It it hurts. Don't don't. It hurts. Don't, don't ask. Okay. Okay. So if I asked you, Jason, go ahead and cast over there for at Brother Pat. Brother Pat, raise your hand. I can hit Pat. Oh no. Too high. You got him over there. You had him over there. Can you get it out? Yeah, there you go. Now you know you're not on the lake. <laughs> go over there towards Pat again. And uh, there you go. There you go. Thank you, Jason. You can't swing here. Um, I'm going to have you do something too. Robert, raise your hand. Both Roberts. You can hit either one, green or blue. There you go. All right, same thing over here. Mark, raise your hand. All right, Jason, hit Mark over there. Awesome. You see what I'm saying? It takes technique. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes effort. Anything worth, come on now. Anything worth having or pursuing takes time and energy and effort. And can I tell you, there's nothing more worthy than the cause of Jesus Christ. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you all very much. I love you, brother. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you all. And I'm here to tell you, we're going to need to spend some time and energy in this, there's people's lives at stake. This is where I finish. You go, but how do I do it? Listen to the, to the sermon of the sower, the parable of the sower. There's different hearts. Some will take the seed, some won't. You don't know, but you've got to be good at sowing that seed, of getting it into that heart. You say, but... But is it all me? No, it's not all you. I'm going to tell you the secret is definitely the Holy Spirit. I already gave you. I kind of showed my hand on that. But there are ways and things that we need to learn about the biblical method. Watch. First of all, did you know that most every person will proclaim their own goodness here in America? This is not unusual. Listen to the book of Proverbs. Most men will proclaim, not just men, women too. I witness to guys out here, I've been witnessing now for the past year, I witness every week, and every single person goes, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I'm going to heaven. Dropping F-bombs and cursing God and this and that, but they're going to heaven. You know why? Because the church has shown what cheap grace can do. Cheap grace. You don't have to change. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is say a prayer. That will send you faster to hell than anything else. You want to know the biblical way of doing it? Watch this. Watch Jesus in Mark 10. Now, he was going out on the road. One came running, knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, so paint the picture with me in your mind. Jesus is walking with his disciples. A young man comes running to him. Good teacher. Humble. At first glance. How many of you know there's false humility? So humble at first glance. Good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is the first thing Jesus addresses? This idea of goodness. Most people that you witness to, you have to address this idea of goodness. I'm a good person. I'm going to heaven. Have you said the prayer? Yeah. Okay, then you're in. Oh, my goodness. How dangerous is that? No, watch. Watch what Jesus says. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. So he's showing him that his idea of God is down here and he's talking about goodness like it's no big thing. C.S. Lewis put it this way. Goodness should 
frighten us. Because if we understood how good God is, we would understand we're in huge trouble. Come on, stay with me on this. Stay with me on this because I'm flying this past week and Pastor Melissa and I, we got a direct flight from Austin to Orlando except it ended up being Fort Lauderdale. And we're like, what? I thought it was a direct flight. And the stewardess says, well, it kind of is, but we had to stop in, our land, in Fort Lauderdale first. But you can scoot up in your seats because we're going to go to, and it's only like a hop, skip, and a jump. So I scoot up in my seats, and I'm kind of annoyed. Come on, anybody with me on this? I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, man, hopefully nobody annoying sits by me. And then God has someone sit by me. I think it was the Lord. I, I, I think it was the Lord. At this point, I don't know for certain. So I'm thinking, like, what is going on here? But this, this guy comes in, and he just has this look about him. And he reminds me of Dr. Rob with a mask. So he's a mask guy coming in, and he sits by me. And I'm like, dude, not a mask guy. Come on. <laughs> It just says something about you, you know, you're still wearing a mask. Give it up, bro. You know, but, but, oh, sorry, Grandma. <laughs> sorry, Grandma. <laughs> but she's 93. Tinny, I don't know your excuse, but, <laughs> but here we go. Here we go. So, so he's. He sits down, and then he starts to talk, immediately starts to talk, and I pick up a, a New York accent. So now a masked guy with a New York accent, come on. This Texas boy's like, I'm already annoyed. And he tells me he's been working for Disney for 50 years, and he lives in, in uh, L.A. New York, L.A., mask, three strikes, you're out, buddy, you're out. So I start shutting down. And the Lord starts speaking to me. And that's what I'm trying to tell you about being honest deep in here. Because I was trying to lie to myself. How was I trying to lie to myself? Trying to justify my feelings. Trying to justify not talking. Trying to, I'm like, okay, Lord, what do you want? I want you to witness to him. Oh, man. <laughs> He's going to be tough. Because immediately started off with this larger than life. I'm telling you, like Dr. Rob, except unsaved. Because he had some colorful language. And he starts like, man, it's going to be a wonderful trip. Y'all going to Disney? Y'all going to Orlando? Y'all going? I said, none of your business, bro. I'm from Texas. We don't share that much. And he goes, oh, it's going to be wonderful. You're traveling with a pretty lady. Can I buy y'all something to drink? I said, it's too early for drinking. I don't want to drink. But then I noticed immediately he got down. I said, buy what you want. The stewardess wouldn't serve us. Thank the Lord. <laughs> but he starts to just, just, you know what? People gripe too much, he said. They don't know when to be happy. You just got to go with the flow. You know what I'm talking about? What's your name? Chris. Chris, you know what I'm talking about. He keeps hitting me like this. <laughs> he keeps hitting me. He goes, Chris, you just got to go with it. You're sitting there with a beautiful girl. I said, you married? He goes, no, they tried to kill me twice. <laughs> And I said, oh. I said, we ought to do something. How long are y'all going to be in Orlando? I said, no, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's going to be a turnaround real quick. <laughs> we ought to do this. There's no we, baby. No, me and her. You got to go. <laughs> but then it just, you know, the Lord's like, come on. And he goes, oh, we'll be, we'll be down before you know it. This and this and that. The Lord's voice gets louder and louder and louder. Finally, there, the pilot comes on and says, we're going to be there and couple minutes, 10 minutes. You'll be off, your, off the plane. Thank you for flying with us. I said, Lord, I don't have time. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I was unfaithful. I wasn't true. I, and I started making excuses, and I felt like the Lord said, none of that is true. I said, okay, the truth is he's kind of, he's not in the mood. I could tell he's, he's like, Man, he's talking about vacation. You know, he's using these, color, these colorful words. He's all about, man, living it up, living life. And he said, but his house is on fire. And what if on that day I'm separating those on the left and you on the right, and he locks eyes with you? And he says, really, man? 
I sat right next to you. Really? You couldn't tell me? You couldn't tell me the truth, man. How much did you have to hate me? I said, but there's little kids and the moms don't want to hear about sin. And I said, okay, Lord, if you help me. I need to know if I'm going to be yelled at. No, I can't assure you that. I want to know if someone's going to get angry because I start bringing stuff up, ruin their vacation in their eyes. I can't promise you that. I got to know that Bill's not going to turn into Dr. Jack. What is it? Dr. Jack, Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde. I can't promise you that, but I can promise you I'll never leave you. I won't forsake you. And I'll guide you. So I said, Bill, how old are you? 77. That's how I started. I said, man, dude, you're getting close. (laughs) And he looked at me. He goes, Chris, that's funny. (laughs) He had that kind of, he goes, that's funny. He goes, yeah, I am. But I've had an amazing life. No regrets. I said, you believe in the afterlife? I I think I do. I said, where do you think you're going? Heaven, for sure. I'm a good person. Come on now. Everyone proclaims their goodness. I'm a good person. I'm not that bad. I treat my ex-wives right. (laughs) He goes, I still talk to them. He says, and he just starts throwing this out there. I said, okay, um. There's a way we can find out. You believe in Jesus? I mean, do you, do you respect him? He goes, yeah, I respect Jesus. And I said, okay, he said there's none good. Who's lying, you or Jesus? Well, heck, man, <laughs> I am. And I said, we can, we can get a little bit, bit, bit more clarity on this if you, you let me ask you some questions. All you got to do is be honest with me. Oh, I can do it. You ever told any lies? Oh, shoot, man. Probably I lied to you. <laughs> and you know, he's just talking. And then, and then I said, okay, so what do you call that? Well, a liar. I said, what are you? A liar. I said, you ever taken anything that wasn't yours? No, nothing big. I said, just small things like diamonds? <laughs> no, no, no. Yes. I, I said, so what are you? A thief. I said, no, you're not. He goes, I'm not. I said, you're a lion thief. Oh! <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. And then I said, um. I said, you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Oh, man, I just did. I said, that's called blasphemy, punishable by death by the king of glory. Punishable by death to use his name in such a disrespectful way. I want you to ask yourself these questions. You ever looked at a woman with lust in your heart? Then you're an adulterer. You're lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterer at heart. We've only covered four If you stand before the king of glory tonight and he judges you based on his moral law and you know what I'm saying is right, you can try to deny the law, but let someone lie to you and you'll call them on it. Let someone steal from you and you'll call them on it. You know it's wrong. Heaven or hell? Are you guilty or innocent? He says, oh shoot, guilty. And then he starts trying to Prove his own worthy, his own righteousness. He goes, man, but you don't understand. I give to St. Jude's. I give this. I give a lot. The other day I was walking in a liquor store and there was a guy begging. I gave him some money, man. Something of that regard. And and I do this and I do that. And I treat my ex-wives right. And I I said, man, innocent or guilty? Well, shoot. What are you doing to me, man? You're trying to. Melissa said he started sweating. Why is this necessary? How else will you reach out to the loving hand of a Savior if you don't know you're drowning? And he says, what are you doing to me? I said, Bill, let's say you're out in my neck of the woods, Texas. And you're out in a country road and you get lost out there in those country roads. Real dark storms coming in, no phone signal. Man, what are you doing? I said, exactly. And you're on E. You decide to just 
sleep for the night. Maybe in the morning you can see the big water tower lead your way out. But at night I come up and I start banging on the door, wake you up in a fright. Before you can get your bearings, I break the window and I drag your butt out of there. And you're, you think the worst, I'm going to kill you. Just then, the train runs over your car. Oh, man, I never saw that one coming. Man, oh, my goodness, Chris, what are you doing? I said, I said, was that fear good or bad? Well, heck, it was good. Watch. The Bible says, by the fear of the Lord, men turn from evil. Men turn from evil. What is necessary for someone to come to Christ? Just confess, but keep going in the wrong direction? No, confession plus turning. That's called repentance. Repentance is a confession. I did wrong, but I don't want to do wrong anymore because I want to leave the evil behind. Bill, if you would repent of your sins and stop putting your trust in you and your goodness, your gifts to St. Jude, your niceness to your ex-wives, or whatever you think you're doing, repent and put your trust in the Savior Jesus Christ, stop putting your trust in you. Stop thinking you're a good person. Stop thinking that you have what it takes to get to heaven. It's like you want to jump out of a plane, like if we had to jump out right now and your idea was to flap your arms to see if you could make it. You're not going to make it. Put on Jesus Christ, the parachute of life. He will save you. But you've got to turn from your sin. Notice what the Bible says Jesus did to the rich young ruler who came to him and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He didn't say, hey, can I tell you God has a wonderful plan for your life? Can I tell you how much God loves you? How good God wants to treat you? How he wants to hug you and kiss you and love you? No, he said, the Ten Commandments, have you kept them? No, you haven't kept them, but the man still thought he did. He said, I'm perfect. I've been good since a child. That's what he said. He proclaimed his own goodness to Jesus. Jesus in the flesh. And he's proclaiming his own goodness. Read it. It's right there. Since I was a child. So you know what Jesus did? He took him to the main commandment. What is the main commandment? Stay with me. What is the main commandment? Tell me. Love the Lord with all your heart, right? That's exactly what Jesus took him to. No, he didn't. He told him to sell all his stuff. Listen. Paul said, I did not know I was a sinner until I read, thou shalt not covet. Francis Schaeffer, the great theologian, said, thou shalt not covet is the inverse. It's the negative way of saying, love the Lord with all you have. Because when you covet against God, you don't love him, you love yourself. And so he said, you have self-love in here. That's the opposite of loving me. Let go of you and all your possessions, because right now you're carrying so much stuff, you can't grab onto me. Let it go, grab onto me, and be saved. <laughs> Biblical evangelism, amen? So I said, Bill, you want to think about this with me anymore? No, I'm done. I said, you preaching on TV? I said, I didn't. I didn't say I was a preacher. You have to be. That's sad. When the only people that someone would think would evangelize is a preacher. I said, now we're going to change that. We're going to have hundreds of preachers. Amen. (laughs) Hundreds of preachers. You may be here today, you might say, Pastor, um, what do you want? Obedience, urgency, get equipped. But right here, I want to tell you, the key is this. I keep worrying about third service. They can can, uh, wait a little bit because I'm going to keep them longer too. So sometimes when you share, I've been noticing this here lately. 
You may not be able to lead them in the prayer of repentance. With Bill, I just kept telling him, listen, repent, turn from your sin, and put your trust in Jesus. He'll do the miracle. He'll do the miracle. You say, did he make a decision? That's between him and his creator. I presented the gospel. Well, what happened with the rich young ruler and Jesus? This is what happened. The rich young ruler dropped his head and he walked away. And Jesus said, it's easier for the what? The camel to make it through the eye of a needle than a rich man is to, to get to heaven. Peter says, then who can be saved? This is why we need to get equipped the biblical way. Because Jesus said, what is impossible for you to do, the Holy Spirit does. Go back up here. The Holy Spirit does what? He is our helper. Next verse. Convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But we have to have the technique from God's word to show them. To show them. Amen? So as you're here, Can you just say, between you and the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I want to be a soul winner. Use me. I'm willing to be obedient. I'm willing to have urgency and I'm willing to be equipped. I'm going to sign up for discipleship this summer, I mean this fall, to become equipped so I can share the gift of life even as it was shared with me. In Jesus' name, amen. He gave his body to be broken and his blood to be shed that we might have life. In Jesus' name. We say thank you. Amen. Have a great, great week.